before I jump into the message today, we are in the seventh week of a series called Good Fruit. More on that in just a minute. But uh, I want to thank you for your incredible generosity. You'll have an opportunity today, as you always do, to give. And you are such a generous church. You respond with hardly any, any, any pressure at all. You just, we just say there are needs and you rise to meet them. We are giving literally hundreds of thousands of dollars into our local city, into the community, into our nation, and really around the world. Uh, into the next generation. We, we saw so many young people really turn their lives over to the care and control of Christ. You saw so many of them baptized just a few weeks ago. And really, that's because people made it possible for us to do that work. So every time you give, every time you serve, you're helping people meet, know, and follow Christ. One of the things that your giving goes to is to create environments. So I thank God every week for the environment of this place that we have for the ability to come to those of you who are at home, all of that technology. I wanna thank you for the Way of the Cross project that uh, is almost done. Because of your generosity, we're not uh, borrowing, we're paying for that with cash as we go. Praise be to God, that's an incredible thing. And what's so great about it, in just uh, in April, it's gonna look like this. The structure is all built now. We have a little open house today, by the way, so if you wanna go out and take a look at the Way of the Cross project, you will see this beautiful Heartland Pavilion that's all built. Uh, you will see the stations of the cross along the path. Um, there is some granite engravings that are coming to be affixed to those in the coming weeks. All that beautiful landscaping is going to be coming. But we have a 15th station. Uh, traditionally, there are 14 stations of the cross that, that lead uh, the person through what it was like to be with Jesus as he endured suffering on his way to the cross. And that 15th station is a resurrection station where we will actually have the names of people that we love who are already with Christ. We're going to memorialize them there. So if you have loved ones that you'd like to memorialize, you can go to our website at heartlandchurch.com. All the information is there. Or just go out today, walk around, meet some of our team, and take a look at uh, this beautiful place the sole purpose of which is to help people meet with God. People are gonna come uh, at any time of day in their difficult moments, in their times of darkest uh, grief or sadness, and they'll be able to encounter the presence of God. So I'm so thankful for your generosity. Now let's jump into this message today as we continue this series called Good Fruit. I hope you'll pull out your notes. Uh, we are uh, breaking down a passage of scripture that's known as the fruit of the Spirit. Now I wanna just do something. I wanna go ahead and just kind of set the stage because I don't wanna just talk to your heads today. I wanna to speak to your heart and there's nothing like just taking a minute to take a breath. And I wanna ask John to come back out again and sing my favorite song. You guys love this song? There is a song that has been just playing in my heart all through the last several weeks. And I want him to sing it one more time. And oh, Nakia's with you. Come on, put your hands together, everybody. And, uh, Go ahead, lead us in it. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All of my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head down, God, I will of the goodness of God. And I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. Look 
grace of God. Yes, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running right in this place. Oh, we love you, Lord. Oh, that's so good. Let me, let me let you in on a little secret. What worship does is it softens the soil of your own heart. It does. It, it, you're so tense and wound up, and we live our lives feeling somehow that we have to control everything. And when you sing a song like that, you remember, all oh, my life, you have been faithful. And you just go, oh, I'm not in charge of nothing. God, you are, you are in charge of it all. You are good. Whether it goes my way or not, I'll still praise you because you're still God. You are still on the throne. I trust you. And what happens is, is your heart gets soft. You're ready now to receive what God wants to say to you. So thank you guys so much. Come on, give them a great hand again. Appreciate it. Your life's going to produce something. So either the spirit is going to be in control and produce fruit that looks like love and joy and peace, long-suffering. See, the flesh doesn't know how to do that. The flesh doesn't want to suffer long. Flesh doesn't want to be kind or be good to people. 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these are fruits of the Spirit, and against these things there's no law. What he's, what he's saying is, is that there's no law that you can follow that can produce that. I mean, you can try to do the right thing, but it's like, it's like an autopilot that wants to do wrong, and you're like pulling on that wheel, but the minute you let go, it just pulls back to your old way. That's because the flesh is producing a way of life. So in Galatians chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, it lists that autopilot, a life that's filled with anger and frustration and outbursts and debauchery and all the stuff where you and I would find ourselves in that list. And then he says, but when the Spirit controls your life, he'll make something beautiful out of you. And you won't have to try to do right anymore. It'll be like you'll take the hand off the wheel and you find suddenly, oh, I'm going in the right direction. Like I don't need the law to tell me what to do. I'm actually doing what's right. It's actually flowing out of my life. That's, that's what this is about. And so let me just recap this for you. We've been learning that it's, it's not just feelings of love. It's love that expects nothing in return, which is amazing because I expect a lot and I have expectations and so do you. And when those expectations are not met, um, man, we can be less than loving. And joy that's not something I have to experience as external happiness, but a joy that's on the inside that gives me the strength to endure whatever problems come. And not just the feelings of peace, but real peace, which is how I'm going to act while experiencing frustration and anxiety and opposition. Long-suffering, not just the ability to wait and be patient, but really, how am I going to act while I'm waiting? How, how am I going to be when it's not going my way and I have to endure? Kindness, not just being a nice person, but having the attitude of, of, of kindness when I'm experiencing ungrateful people, wicked people, people who oppose you. And, and if, if kindness is the attitude, then goodness is the action, the behavior of how am I going to act when I'm experiencing that opposition? And last week I talked to you about how faithfulness is just, God, you have been so faithful. I don't know how you're going to work it out, but I know you're going to work it out. Like, I don't, I don't have to know. That's what that song is all about that we just sang. And so it comes today to the eighth fruit of the Spirit. All right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight through the Spirit, which is gentleness. That's what we're going to talk about today. Actually, this is a very, very challenging fruit of the Spirit for me. And so what I'm going to do today is this is just a message for your pastor. I'm just going to preach to me, and you all take whatever application you want to take for yourselves. But that's just what I'm going to do today. Thank you so much, you guys. Because, because gentleness is not just a challenge for your pastor. It's really a challenge for all leaders. Because leaders carry responsibility. Leaders often have the sensation of there are more things to do than there is time in the day. And speed is the enemy of gentle. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. When there is so much to do and there's not enough time, you can become a little bit task-oriented and less people oriented. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody feel like when there's more to do than you have time, you get a little short with people? Or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's this way. Maybe you listen a little less. It's not like you have the wrong intentions. It's just that you're busy. There's stuff to do. Come on, people, move. Like, I don't have the desire to cuss people out, but sometimes I just want to <laughs> cuss somebody out. Am I the only one? <laughs> Amen, right. Thank you all for talking to me today. That nine o'clock service, I don't know what is wrong with them. They just look at me. But gentleness is a challenge for leaders. It's a challenge for people who are going too fast. And I, I want to be a good pastor, but man, sometimes people will get on my last nerve. I'm in the people business, and they will, they will stomp on that nerve till you, your pastor will sometimes want to cuss, and sometimes... Sometimes y'all hear me when I do it. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Or, or, or I'll just act like I'm, like I'm listening, but I'm really not. I'm like, oh, your mother died. Oh, okay. 
But I'm thinking about what I have to do next. And I don't mean to do that, but it's just sometimes, you know, we have so much to do. I remember it wasn't long ago, I was talking to a person in our church and they were, t- they were explaining, Pastor, it's hard for me. I'm the only man in the grief share group. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, I'm the only, there's just a bunch of women and I'm the only man and it's hard for me. And I'm like, I got stuff to do. And I'm like, yeah, really? I'm, I'm listening. And then I, so in a, in a blast of just trying to fix it, I said, well, you know what you need to do is, is just tell all the women to bring their husbands, then you won't be the only one. And he looked at me and went, they're dead. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and that sort of just snapped me into <laughs> Jesus. I don't, I don't want to be like that, but sometimes being gentle is the hardest thing to do. It's a challenge for leaders. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this. Preaching to me, y'all can write what you want, but gentleness is how leaders are to treat people under their care. And the problem is, is that we have people today who are in a position of leadership that they don't know how to treat people right. And it's not just a problem in church. I'm telling you, there is a global leadership crisis that's happening right now. There's a, there's a leadership crisis, not just in our country, but it's, it's spread across the world. And I don't have to convince you of this because the way you get elected now is to be unkind to people. I mean, the way you get elected is you, you embarrass people, you humiliate people, you name call people, you put people down, and that's not leadership. You cannot lead people who are being put down, belittled, made fun of, ridiculed, tweeted about in a humiliating, like that is not leadership. Like that may get you elected, but that is not leadership. And so you have, so, so God wants to elevate some of you into positions of leadership. I mean, God's got, God wants to raise you. He has, he's actually already put it into your heart that, that you feel that God wants to elevate you in life. But the problem is, how are you ever going to get there if you don't know how to treat people right today? Like, how are you ever going to be somebody's boss? You can't, if you can't treat your coworkers right today, how are you ever going to treat them right when you're their boss? So this becomes an issue for us. How do we treat people? And gentleness for leaders, it's, it's when you, you recognize you have privilege and you have, you have authority, you have power, but it is under control. You're under the control of the Holy Spirit. That, that you, have, you recognize there is a proper way that authority is supposed to be expressed. Now, gentleness is a word that you might often associate with the care of children and not with leadership. But you cannot lead people without this quality. And what I have found the hard way and what I have learned and what I am learning is that God will delay your elevation until you learn how to treat people right. Gentleness is is leading without arrogance, leading without pride. It is respectful. It is honoring. Wouldn't you follow a leader like that today? But where are they? Where are our leaders today who lead in the way that our heart longs? That's the way you would want to be treated. What, what, I, what really gentleness is, and where I'm going with this, is that the Greek word that's used in the passage actually is better rendered humility. Gentleness is humility. It is It was a contrary word. It was hard to translate because this was a new word in this culture. It was not a value like we see it today. But in that culture, humility would have been seen as weakness. Um, It would have been seen as something that was not desirable. In the Roman Greek world, humility was not a a value. It was was for the weak. And so we are on a, we're on a track in the world today where that is coming full circle, where to be humble is to be seen as, as weak. And, yet, and yet, yet all of us need this quality because we are all called to lead in some capacity. I'm not the only one. You're, you're a leader too. You're a leader on your job. You're a leader in your home. You're a leader in your family. You may be a leader at school. You may be a leader of a team. You may be a leader of a group. You may be a leader of a ministry. (laughs) And uh, and God knows all of us are called to lead yourself. But if we don't know how to lead ourselves, how will we ever know how to lead other people? 
And so we need this. We, 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 are, we are leaders and we need to lead with gentleness and humility. That's what God wants. Now, <laughs> I don't see much disagreement. I think I would look around the room and read this room right now and I would have you all saying, that's right, pastor, that's good. When you're in church <laughs> and when you're in your little devotional time with God with your coffee cup and your journal, you will write the most beautiful thoughts about humility. <laughs> oh God, help me to be a humble person today. And God knows I've written a lot about humility in my life, but that is not where it counts. I'll tell you where it counts is what are you going to do when people oppose you? Anybody have some conflict in your life today? <laughs> Can I say that again? Anybody have any conflict in your life today? Yeah. See, that's how you know you're a leader. When, when you're trying to do something and, and trying to go in a certain direction and somebody's opposing you, that's leadership. You're trying to go somewhere and there's opposition. And so that's the question. How, how, do, I be, how, do, I, how do I respond with gentleness and humility when, you're, when people are opposing you? Y'all understand this is my whole life. Like every week, like this is my, like somebody is mad about something every single week. Don't look at me like that. You know it's true. <laughs> Why did he say this? I don't like what the church is doing on this. I don't like this opinion. I don't, like every week there's a letter, there's emails, there's people wanting to have a, set up a meeting. <laughs> there are, there, because people, people are, People are just like crazy. <laughs> and it's a, it's a struggle, and it's a struggle because I can have these very humble, beautiful thoughts about what it means to be a Christian, a leader, and a pastor, and then you have to live in the real world with people who are crazy, who are, <laughs> who are, who are uh, it's coming at you all the time. Why, why are we doing this? And you know, sometimes my attitude, when it's not in the right place, is sort of like, you know, uh, if God had wanted your way, he'd have made you the pastor of the church. <laughs> Come on, talk to me, you all know, that's how you feel sometimes. But you can't express it like that. But, the, but, but this is where it's going to be played out. If you ever find yourself in a position where people are opposing you, name calling you, writing stuff about you, saying stuff, giving you the rolls of the eyes, giving you some sort of criticism about what you're doing, then you need, you need this. Because I, I, frankly, I, I need the Spirit of God to give me something that I probably would not have in the natural the way God has wired me and made me, I'm probably more wired for speed. But if I'm going to be effective, then God has to grow something in my life. Let me show you something. God says he gives us more grace. Say that with me. More grace. What do you need in your life? More grace. More grace. That's what I need. That's what you need. More grace. Grace is when I get something that I don't deserve, but I get it anyway. And when God treats me a certain way, I should be thankful and grateful for that. And what, what I'm supposed to do is give people what I have received. Like if freely given, freely give. And what grace is, grace is the power and the capacity to, to do something and to be something, all that I should be. So God gives more grace to a certain kind of person, but he, he hates pride. In fact, more than just hates pride, it says God opposes the proud. So when you're filled with pride, God's actually working against you. That's what it says. But he, what's this? He shows favor to the humble. So in other words, if I want the blessing of God on my life, let me just break this down again. I need more grace. So what is grace? Grace is, God, I need you. God, I can't do this. God, will you, will you give me something in my life that I don't have the power to do? When you come to God with this attitude, God, I need more of you in my life, it's like God says, thank you, that's all I wanted from you. And then God says, with that, that's like the open door, I will enter into your life and I will start to work for you. I will give you more grace, I will give you favor because you came with a humble attitude. And if we can cultivate that humility, we don't have to work for all these fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will produce the fruit in us if we will come with humility. I will give more grace and I will give you more favor, but you gotta be humble. Jesus said it this way, whoever humbles himself 
as this little child. I don't know how old the child was, but it, it, was, not, it was under two years of age. <laughs> I have a grandson now, and he just turned two, and that little joker is about as stiff neck right now as he, he went from this, like, beautiful, like, um, I want to do everything you ask, Poppy, you know, and now he has his own mind. There's a little stage, a little child where, where a child wants to respond with, they want to please. They want, I'm not saying he doesn't want to do that, but not all the time like he used to. But there's a, there is a, a, a period of life where a child wants to listen, wants to follow, wants to hold their hand, wants to be led, wants to respond. Hey, you know, come close here. Okay, daddy. But then there comes a point in life where we start smelling ourselves a little bit and going, I don't need to do nothing that you're telling me to do. <laughs> and I can just, no. And that sticks with us. And the older we get, sometimes you can be like 60, 70 years old now, and you're like, nobody's telling you nothing. So whoever humbles himself like this little child actually will be the greatest. And, it, and, and I think that means not just the greatest in terms of everybody else, but you'll become a great person. You want to be great, like a real, like great in life, great in character, great in, in, in stature, in your statesmanship, then become humble. So this is the call of God. So the question is, how am I going to do that when I'm wired so much for the opposite? Well, it starts with a humble attitude, but I want, to give you, I want to give you two passages of Scripture now that changed my life. Actually, my pastor shared these with me, and they have had a profound effect on my leadership. Who I am as a pastor today is different from what I used to be, and I aren't, I'm not perfect yet. I still want to cuss out some, of, some, of, some people. <laughs> not some of you, it's just some people. So I'm growing, I'm getting there. I'm not there, I'm not where I wanna be, but I'm not where I used to be. And I wanna, I wanna help you with, with some scripture that has profoundly changed my life. So you ready for this? One thing to do and one thing not to do. That's how simple this is gonna to be today. One thing to do, one thing not to do. Here's the first passage. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are spiritual, should restore. Two key operative words. You who are spiritual. Look at your neighbor and says, you're not spiritual. This isn't, talk, this isn't about you. You don't have it. <laughs> you ain't spiritual. That is true. In the natural, we are not spiritual. We could not do this. But he says, he says it's really interesting. You who are spiritual, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. You who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness and humility, considering carefully yourself, lest you also fall into the same temptation. <laughs> so let's go back to this. You have to restore somebody who has missed the mark, a person who has fallen short. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't say what they were supposed to say. They said the wrong thing. They did the wrong thing. They were in the wrong place with the wrong people. They didn't meet your expectations to do what was right. They fell down. They did something embarrassing. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. And that is not what the church does today. We cancel such a one. Come on, somebody, that's exactly. What we do today is we crucify our wounded. We, we publicly crucify our wounded. We, we, like, we have a thing going on in this world today where everybody feels a little bit so bad about themselves that they're just looking for somebody else to point the finger at and say, well, at least I'm not like that person. And we are so quick to point out the faults of others, to judge, to criticize, to, to hold them up on a standard that we would never be able to survive on ourselves. Because the only difference between that person who fell short, who missed the mark, who did the wrong thing, and you is that they just got caught. <laughs> they just, who in here has not done something said something, gone somewhere, been with somebody, looked at something, did something that if that were exposed out in the world, we would be just like all those other condemned people. 
So that's all of us. And yet, he says, you who are spiritual. Let's go back to that. Who's spiritual? Okay, so a spiritual person is a person who has been made right with God. They're not, they're not someone who's, who's far from God. They're, they're spiritual. Their spirit is alive. And how, we, how that happens is God gives us his grace. Grace, is, great, grace comes when we believe that Jesus died for our sins and he rose from the dead. And he who puts his faith and trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross, they recognize that he died for me. He paid for my sins. He rose from the dead. When I receive that, God says, I will justify you as if you never sinned. I will look at you as if you didn't do the thing that you did. You would now have right standing with God. Oh, somebody just praise God for that right there. That is, we don't praise him enough to say, God, I thank you that you made me spiritual. Hebrews says, I can now come boldly before God without any embarrassment, and I can make my prayer requests known unto him because I have been made right with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, if I have received that kind of grace from God, you who are spiritual, you all better give that same grace to somebody else. If you can't give the grace that you have received, I mean, that's just the worst kind of hypocrisy ever. So what the first thing he says to do here is do restore. Like, make this your practice. Quit condemning, quit canceling other people when they make mistakes and when they fall short and when they do wrong. I thank God that, that, that we have a community, I, I hope that we are a community that says this is a place for a person to be saved, to be healed, to be restored, and God, watch God, he even redeems people's past mistakes when they get into the right environment. What restore means is to bring people back to the original status, like where they were before. That's what, that's what grace is, is that God put me back he justified me just as if I never sinned. He's restored me back to my original condition. And yet we live in a world today where it's so easy to cancel people. And I think I wanna speak specifically to all of us for just a moment who would call yourselves a brother or a sister in Christ. Because it's so easy just to go the way of the world, to just float along with Facebook and Twitter and all those things that are now in our lives today where we could just unconsciously participate in this culture of canceling people. When we ought to be the most grateful, most respectful, most honoring, most humble. God, you have forgiven me of all of my sins. What you've done for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do for others. In fact, what, 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 what gentleness actually is, is treating other people the way you hope you would be treated if it ever got out. I'll just leave that right there. So that's the first thing he wants us to do, is to restore people. But there's something that we should not do as well. Can I show you the next thing? This is what we gotta stop doing. Can I show this to you? You guys gonna be all right? You still wanna see it? You're gonna love me if I show it to you anyway? I said that in the last service, and a lady right on the front row, she said, you show me first. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so like you may not love me after, okay. But y'all are with me today. Here, here, here's the verse, okay? Brothers or sisters, oh wait, I just did that verse. Let me go back again. Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Second Timothy chapter two. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Oh, pastor, you have to go there. <laughs> a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are fighting against you, who are opposing you, who are giving you opposition. If God perhaps well, maybe, like if you respond in the right way, maybe God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive to him to do his will. So what he's saying there, if you call yourself a servant of the Lord, man, this was challenging to me. I, I can remember um, 
I can remember reading this verse because my pastor had pointed out some behavior in my life and he said, you know, you're, you're, you, you got it right, but you're doing this the wrong way. Because the scripture says you're not to quarrel. And I remember really having to wrestle through this. And I remember actually praying, God, I need you to give me grace for this because I don't know if I have it. But I ask you, would you help me to grow a fruit of your spirit of gentleness that I don't have and help me to grow? And God has begun to answer that prayer. So the first thing he says don't do is don't quarrel. Because you know what quarreling is? Let me just give you a little definition. It's to heatedly react. Typically about something trivial. To which all of you offended say, well, it ain't trivial to me. Because it never is. See, when it happens to you, it's not trivial. It seems like a big deal. And can I just, let me just teach you something today. That it's typically trivial, but, it's, but the meaning you make is what makes it so big. It's the story you tell about what the person did. Can I just slow that back down? <laughs> they did something, and your brain made meaning of it. Your brain told a story that made it a big deal. And there's a big difference between the two, and we don't see that. We always say things like, well, do you know what they did to me? No, they did something, but your brain made a meaning out of it. Your brain told a story about it. And sometimes that story has nothing to do with them. It has to do with something that happened yesterday, and there was a situation or a trauma or something that happened in your own life, and now they just touched it, and it's, and it's a big deal. And the scripture says, you who are spiritual, don't quarrel. Don't heatedly react. Typically about anything that's, that's just trivial, just trivial, slow down. <laughs> the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, watch this, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those. So let me give you an example. I, I wasn't sure if I was even gonna tell this story today. I told it to the first service, it worked out okay. This is round two. In 2012, um, that was, I think it was February, that's when Trayvon Martin was killed. And I remember really being affected deeply by that and I called my, one of my closest friends is Jeffrey Johnson, he's the pastor of the Eastern Star Church. And I was listening to him and I, and I said, what are you gonna do? And he says, well, tomorrow I'm going downtown, I've got some things we're gonna say, there's a, there's a rally that's gonna be on the courtyard steps. So I said, I'm coming with you. And I drove with him and in the car, he's telling me about, he has four sons, all about right in that same age at the time. And he was telling me like, this is, this is how it impacts me. This is the fear that I have. Like what if one of my boys was racially profiled? And so I went along just feeling the pain he was feeling and identifying with it. And, and I didn't have anything to say. I was, I was still working out, how am I gonna talk about things that people have such a hard time understanding? But I knew that I had to be there with my friend. And the time came, other people were speaking on that rally, lots of different voices, but he got up and he said, this is how it affects me as a father. He began to explain it. As he's talking, rain began to fall. So I took my umbrella and I walked over to him and I held the umbrella over his head as he spoke. Somebody took a picture of that and it became the front page of the Indianapolis Star, Jeffrey Johnson, Darren Chesky's holding an umbrella over his head. And that set off some kind of a fight in Heartland Church. <laughs> because there were people who immediately took to Twitter and, and fa Facebook and they were saying like, what are you doing down there at a place like that? What do you have to do with that kind of a situation? Why are you, why would you, because they thought it was like a political thing and uh, friends, I, I'm holding an umbrella you know, so I was feeling a little righteous about it. You might be talking about me on Twitter, but I had the microphone come Sunday. Let me just tell you. <laughs> oh, don't encourage me. Please don't. Because I said something along the lines of, you don't like the way I'm pastoring this church. You can go on down the street, you know, something like that. And I was a little, I was just kind of like, well, I didn't even say nothing. I didn't even say a word. I, I, but I, I, I felt this sort of, and so, so that was instructive for me, and I began to identify and speak and say things. And there was all this, you know, stuff I was beginning to absorb. 
And while I felt sort of a righteousness about what I was doing, my, my approach was not very gentle, I remember at the time. Now at the very same time, as I began to identify and be supportive and pastoral, not political, but very pastoral in my voice, especially when people are hurting, I'm gonna talk about that. Y'all, if you're brand new today, if, if, if something causes people in this church to hurt, you know I'm gonna talk about it. So I was learning how to do that. Well, while, while I'm doing that, there are, there are some people on the other side who are saying, Pastor, you're not saying enough. And we need you to say more. And your silence, and I'm like, silence? And they're like, your silence is like white pastors who are complicit. And I was getting it from the other side. And I had that same sort of righteous sort of like, if you don't like the way I'm pastoring this church, <laughs> go on down the road, <laughs> you know. I had, I was in the middle and I was feeling a little righteous about this. And this is when I began to talk to my pastor. I can't pastor crazy people, pastor. They're crazy, I tell you, they're crazy. And he began to say, you know, you got the right heart, but your approach is wrong. Because he took me this passage of scripture and says, you know, the man of God, the servant of the Lord, he must not quarrel with people. Oh, you got to be gentle with people. They're your sheep. You got to be able, you got to teach them. You got to be patient in humility, you have to correct people. And I remember going, I don't wanna do that. It'd just be easier to just not have people that I don't like around me. <laughs> but I'm not like that. When, when, <laughs> when God spoke to me that day, I was like, Lord, I have to change. And this, 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 this marked me and has changed the way I pastor you. And I began to uh, make a list of all the people that I had gotten into it with in these back and forth and some of this Twitter stuff and some of the things I had said. And I mean, I was, I was right. <laughs> but, but I was so not this right here. So I made a list and I, it was a long list and I started setting out for about six months. It was like a lot of very long dinner conversations. I would invite people to dinner. And I would say something like this, look, I've wronged you. I've quarreled with you and I shouldn't have done that. I should have been listening to you. I didn't really listen because what quarreling is, and I don't know if, uh, if I, let me just go back a second. What quarreling is, is like tit for tat. Quarreling is like, you say something, I say something. You make a point, well, I make a counterpoint. You, you say this and it hurts me, I defend myself and I'm right and we go, that's what quarreling is. It's when you're going, and the scripture was clear, like the, like the man of God should not be going back and forth like that. You don't need to stop trying to win the argument and win the person. So, you gotta, so I'm here to listen to you, I'm here to understand. I'm here to know what is it that's going on. And, I, and during those, those conversations, I would, I would say things like, and then what happened? And when did you first feel this way? And when, and I, I, I started, I just kept doing that until I unpacked the whole story. One, one young white leader, this one man, he told me that when he was a younger man, he had been shamed and he felt like he'd been shamed and pointed out as a racist and it, it wounded him deeply. And so me just even talking about these issues, it reminded him of all that that went on and he immediately brought all that emotion to the surface and that's why he was so upset. And in that moment I realized, you're not even mad at me. You, you, your brain made meaning of something I said. And I was gentle with this man and I, and I listened and I validated where he was coming from and I told him how that was terrible what happened to you. And then I began to, we began to talk back and forth and we began to, I began to hear what he had to say and he had to hear what I had to say. And you know what? God worked in that situation. I sat with another young man who was a leader and, and he was one of those ones that thought, you're not saying enough, pastor. And he was upset, young black man. And so what I did was I said, I've got to correct him. So I, I called one of our other older black leaders in the church and we arranged to meet on a football field during a practice uh, of one of our students and we sat there and I, this young man came and I'm quarreling. I mean, I'm going tit for tat. Like, don't you know what kind of church we are? And can't you see? And, you know, here's this leader right here. <laughs> this man told me, he says, the whole time he wasn't listening to me, he was, he, this is what he was thinking. He was like, you didn't come here to listen. You just came here to show me you have a black friend. 
So I was like, well, I didn't see that. So we just had this long conversation. And in those conversations, you know what God did? The Holy Spirit began to repair things. And God began to work in, I learned some things. You know, this is back, this is quite a few, few years ago. God taught me, taught me things. God gave me perspective. God gave me uh, wisdom. God, God instructed your pastor and instructed those folks as well. So by the time 2020 came around, we weren't the same people. We weren't even the same church. We had the ability and the capacity to navigate things that probably would have messed us up, but, but we held together. Sometimes God will take you through tough things that look like conflict, and it's not even conflict at all. God's going, I'm just getting you ready for what's coming. If you will just respond in the right way. But you see, we don't have the perspective of that. We're just upset in the moment, like they said something to me that's not right. And we miss what God might be wanting to say. I can't, I did, I can't tell you how many of those long dinners I had, but I'm telling you, the humility that came in my life through sitting down and listening to people has changed how I pastor you. And my word to you today, and it's really to me, we will never get to the places God has for us if we do not learn how to be gentle with people. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, be gentle, able to teach, be patient in humility, in humility correcting. In humility saying, no, 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 come around. What you need is freedom. You need to go to a freedom group, you know? Like all that stuff in yesterday, that has nothing to do with right now. And so many of us, I wonder how many of you are upset about things that have nothing to do with right now, but has to do with stuff that was hurtful in the yesterdays of your life. And you need to go to freedom. You need to go through one of our freedom groups. I, but, but I could never get there if I came with the approach of I'm right. I had to win the heart first. You see what I'm saying? And here's what's amazing about this. What this scripture says, and I'm gonna end here, this last part is the best part because if I respond in the right way, and if I'll come with the right attitude, and if I will be patient, and the scripture says if I'll be gentle and humble, if I bring the right spirit, what God does is God will work it out on the other side in their hearts. Perhaps God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, so that they can come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. I don't know, I don't know their story. I don't know how to untangle all of that, but I know that God knows how to do it. And the good news is, is that if I will come with the right spirit, God's got my back. If I come with the right attitude, God says, I'll fight your battles. I'll change hearts. I'll touch people's minds. I will, I will correct them if you will come in the right way. And my friends, I'm telling you, this is true. This is true. This is true. If I will come in the right spirit, it's amazing to me how God will do his work in the other person's heart almost every single time. So am I there yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not where I want to be, but guess what? I'm growing. I'm not where I want to be, but God is taking me somewhere. I know that there's a future coming when you will make me mad and you will never know it. <laughs> there's a future coming where you'll make me angry and you will never know because the Spirit of God has filled me with gentleness. And if you'll hold me accountable to this, and I'm giving you my word to pass you this way, I want you to do the same thing as you spread the love of Jesus across this community to everybody you know. Come on, everybody. Let's restore people, and let's stop quarreling with people, and let's look like Jesus. You guys receive this today? All right, all right, all right. Let's pray. Let's pray, because somebody here needs to be restored. You came to church and you're the one that's feeling the cutoff from God. You, you're filled with the shame of it, the hurt of it. Maybe you let God down. Maybe you let your own standards down, let alone God's. You came to the right place. You are in a church filled with people who know what grace looks like. You're in a place where you can be restored. Jesus saves, he heals, he restores. If you will respond to him in a humble moment and say, God, I need you, he will not reject you. We will not reject you. We'll come around you. And I've watched God do it over and over again. He will redeem the mistakes of yesterday. What that word means is he will make something good happen out of the bad that took place. 
And so I wanna invite you into that real relationship with God today, to restore your relationship with him. Maybe you were a Christian at one time and you've turned your back on him or you've backslidden or you've walked away, but you know, today is the day I need to get right with God. Or maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. Maybe you're just watching at home right now, but you say, I, I need to get closer to God. Would you lift your hand right where you are and just say, Pastor, that's me. I see you. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody else lift it up? I got you. Yep, yes, yes, yes. That's so good. That's so humble. It's just, it's inviting God into your life. Yes, I got you. Anybody else? Yes, right there. I see you. Pray this prayer with me. God, I know that I need you. Just tell them that. Admit it. I need you. I'm so sorry for trying to live without you. Come into my life. I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. You rose again. You have to make that as a declaration of your own faith. Say, I believe in you. And I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to be your servant. You be my Lord. Say this last part. I give you my life. The Holy Spirit, I pray for every person who is praying this prayer. I pray that you will help them to grow. I pray that you will restore them. I pray that you will redeem every mistake. And may all of us, Lord, today, we all commit to you this posture of humility. Lord, we want to do what you want. We want to do what your Spirit says. So we invite you to come and create in us a new heart. We ask you to give us more grace. Give us your fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We can't make it happen. But Lord, we, we surrender to you and we pray that we would not recognize ourselves even a year from now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. All right, that's awesome. Way to go.